Welcome into another remote edition of Cronkite Sports Now. I'm Rob Warner, and we thank you for tuning in and hope you're happy, healthy, and safe. Let's get this week off started the right way. And right now, states all across the country are taking preventive measures to stop the spread of COVID-19, including closing schools. Today, Arizona Governor Doug Ducey announced that all K-12 schools will be closed for the remainder of the school year. And quickly after that, the AIA released a statement saying that all spring athletic events have been canceled at this time. Cronkite News reporter Sean Soleil has the story now on high school athletes and how they'll be affected across the state. It's springtime in Arizona, which means that high school baseball diamonds across the state should be bustling with activity. However, due to the COVID-19 outbreak, that won't be the case in 2020. Earlier today, Governor Doug Ducey announced that all on-campus learning is canceled through the spring semester. This includes all school-sponsored sports and activities. The AIA, which regulates high school athletics in the state, held out hope that sports could continue in a later date. But as Sports Information Coordinator Seth Polanski explains, there was nothing more they could do once the ruling came down. It, it was going to come down from the top. If, if, if the cancellation was going to happen and that's what happened today. Um, you know, it, it, we feel bad about it, especially for the seniors, but we definitely wanted to hold out hope and um, do everything we could if we could, um, if the state would allow us. But unfortunately, the decision today kind of forced our hand. Perhaps the team that felt the effects of the season being cut short the hardest was the Hamilton Huskies, as they were rated the number one team in the country and off to a 7-0 start. Head coach Mike Woods explains that while his team is disappointed that they couldn't make a run at a state championship, he feels especially bad for his seniors. It's really too bad, um, and I just really feel for our boys, especially our seniors. And I, and I think something that, that not everybody pays attention to, not only do they, get to, they don't get to finish their season, they don't get to finish their senior year. You know, the fourth quarter of your senior year is usually a, just a fun time, it's an exciting time. So for them to lose that as well, uh, it's just very disappointing. Another team that is trying to cope with the reality of their season ending so soon is the Chaparral High School Firebirds, who was off to a 5-2 and two start before the season was cut short. First-year head coach Troy Gerlach shared his message to the team after hearing today's news. I told my guys, I'm like, you know, I just told them I love them. You know, there's, you know, life isn't fair, and there's decisions that are going to be made throughout your life that you have no control over, and this is one of them. And, you know, the great thing about baseball is you can learn a lot about life playing this game because it's built around failure. And this is, you know, unfortunately, this is something that the whole country's got to deal with. While both teams must now deal with the disappointment of not being able to complete their season or play the sport they love, both managers made their point clear. Nothing is more important than the game of life. In Tempe, Sean Salehi, Cronkite News. The AIA has no plans to postpone or cancel any sporting events this fall, but will continue to monitor the situation as it progresses. And today, major news hit Arizona State basketball as Bobby Early took to Twitter to announce that first-team All-Pac-12 point guard Remy Martin plans to enter the NBA draft. A fan favorite, Martin wrote in the message, I also want to thank my teammates, Coach Hurley, and the entire coaching staff for trusting me and allowing me to be myself on and off the court. Starting from a young age, I've worked toward the opportunity to play in the NBA, and I have now decided to take another step into making my dream a reality. I will forever cherish the time I've spent at ASU. Arizona will always be a home to me because of the ASU supporters and 942 crew. The point guard averaged 19.1 points, 4.1 assists, and 3.1 rebounds this season. His campaign propelled the Devils to their third consecutive 20-win season and potentially to a third consecutive NCAA tournament berth. It's unclear whether Martin is completely set on the decision to leave ASU regardless of whether he is forecasted to be selected in this year's draft. In global news, the IOC and Japanese organizers made the decision last week to postpone the Summer Olympics until next year because of the coronavirus pandemic. Today it was announced the Tokyo Games will begin on July 23rd, 2021 with the opening ceremonies. The Games will conclude on August 8th with the closing ceremonies. The Summer Olympics were originally scheduled to begin this summer on July 24th. Each baseball player has a different way to break in a new glove. Reporter Brandon Jensen went out to Scottsdale Stadium and spoke with some Giants about techniques they've used on their gloves. Baseball gloves. No two are the same. 
because no two baseball players are the same, and every player has a different method for getting their glove to their liking. The Rawlings gloves, they come in, you know, you can get them pre-broken in or you can, you know, you can ask them a little more firm and I get mine firm and I like to break it in my own way. You know, it's, you know, hitting it, beating it, you know, I don't have to roll it up and tie a belt around it anymore. They come, you know, I like to, to form it to the task at hand, which is playing catch. Catcher Ricardo Genoves has also been through some of the traditional methods of breaking in a glove. But Genovez has found, we'll say, a more interesting method of breaking in his glove. I used a microwave with a catcher glove, so that helped a lot. Yes, like a bag of popcorn, Genovez breaks his glove in by putting it in the microwave. And other than the Rawlings logo melting off, Genovez says it's done him well over the years. That's the only thing that just happens to the gloves. But everything else, they just get loose and warm, so I can, I can, I can use it real quick. But just how long does it take to break in a glove? Well, that varies too. Mauricio Dubon says he needs a couple of weeks. Jerry Blevins says he needs an off season, but Hunter Pence was in a long-term relationship with his last glove. Yeah, I used the same glove for like 10 years, and then I had the same, like, uh, the, the other glove I would use would be my batting practice glove. And so whenever the one that I used for 10 years I felt like was done, I started using my batting practice glove and that one's working good now and so now I have a new batting practice glove. So whether you pop your glove in the microwave for a few minutes or win two World Series with it, it all comes down to what works for you. I've learned, you know, kind of what, what feels right for me and if, if it feels right on your hand, it feels right playing catch, then it, it translates to the game. In Scottsdale, Brandon Jensen, Cronkite News. After giving it some more thought, Hunter Pence said that he may have actually had his last glove even longer than 10 years. And now it's time for our Arizona Sports Rewind series, and today's story looks back on a special Sun Squad. We now send it to reporter Sean Rice, who has the story from March 30th, 2005. On today's Arizona Sports Rewind, we take a look back at March 30th, 2005. On this date, the Phoenix Suns clinched their second consecutive Pacific Division title. And there's truly one word that describes this special Suns team. Pace, pace, and more pace was what defined the 2005 Phoenix Suns team. Something that head coach Mike D'Antoni told Suns game time was done by design. The whole thing we try to do is just a uh, fast-paced game, keeping the uh, tempo up and having great ball movement, great teamwork, and having guys all pulling for each other. That fast-paced style of play had many other coaches and players from around the league taking notice. They're the most unique team in the league. I mean, uh, that style of play is incredible. It's tiring. <laughs> You got to rush back on defense against Phoenix Suns. It's tiring, but, you know, it's fun to go out and just compete. Yeah, it's very, it's very tough. You really got to um, get a lot of sleep the night before. The Suns were led by a trio of potent scorers in Steve Nash, Amari Stoudemire, and Sean Marion. This had NBA experts evaluating the Suns' playoff hopes. Now you can put five guys on the floor that can each score 20 points, uh, which makes matchups impossible, makes double teaming next to impossible. But you look at them right now, and even though I wouldn't pick them as my favorite to get to the finals, you got to give them all the credit in the world. You can't rule them out. They can beat anybody. The Suns' unique playing style was even on the minds of some of the NBA's greats. Keep doing what they're doing. You know, people always say, well, they don't have the big power guy in the middle. You know, they say, well, how are they going to adjust to Shaq? And people have to adjust to Mar Stoudemire, and he can be a, he can be a monster in there. Well, it can work. It just have to, when you get to the playoffs, you just have to stick with your game. You see, they said we, we couldn't do it either. And we end up five championships later. Some say that the Suns playing style from the 2000s, getting shots up in seven seconds or less, served as a catalyst for how the NBA is played today. The 2005 Suns team entered the playoffs as a number one seed, and Nash and company had high hopes for winning their first NBA title. However, they were eliminated by the eventual NBA champion, San Antonio Spurs. Reporting in Phoenix, Sean Rice, Cronkite News. We're now joined by reporter Sean Rice with more on today's Arizona Sports Rewind. And Sean, let's go back in time. March 30th, 2005, the Suns have just won their second consecutive Pacific Division title. What was special about that team? What was so special about that squad was, I think, the composition of the roster. They had three main guys that were the point of attack for Mike D'Antoni's squad. Uh, Steve Nash, running the point, was an MVP caliber point guard. Uh, Amari, Amari Sotomayor, who might have been an undersized big man, uh, was very versatile down there and could play against bigger guys. And then Sean Marion on the perimeter was a great three-point threat and was really their best defender. Um, so when they had those three guys going and working, <clears throat> working well, uh, they were winning a lot of games. And what was unique about what Mike D'Antoni was trying to run offensively with that team? 
So Mike D'Antoni had an interesting philosophy. What he, what he talked about in practices and to the media a lot was a seven seconds or less philosophy. And what that meant was that he was trying to get the ball down the court in the 24 second shot clock as quick as possible and get up a shot in the first seven seconds of the shot clock. And so a lot of times what that would look like was Steve Nash coming down with the ball, uh, Mario Stoudemire, another big man coming up and getting a ball screen. And that would uh, open the offense up for Steve Nash to either shoot a three pointer, come out and shoot a little mid range day or kick it out to a guy uh, that uh, could shoot a three and then make it a lot of times or dish it to Mario Stoudemire when he's rolling to the basket. Uh, so this is what their offense looked like a lot. And they shot a lot of three pointers. Um, they like to get out and transition and score as quick as possible. And this is something that, that Mike D'Antoni is still doing to this day as the coach of the Houston Rockets. And so the Suns didn't go on to win the championship. They lost in the Western Conference Finals to the San Antonio Spurs in seven games. The Spurs would go on to win the NBA Finals uh, right after that. But this team seemed like it sort of paved the way for what the league is today with the, the run-and-gun game, shooting as many threes as possible. It seems like what they did then really has made an impact in how, how the game's been played today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think this is something that Mike D'Antoni has instilled into the NBA. I think he's been kind of the founding father of that style. Uh, he's something he still does today with the Houston Rockets. Um, if you look at the composition of the Houston Rockets roster today, they, they play without a true traditional center. P.J. Tucker, who is traditionally a forward, is playing center for them at like 6'7". And so uh, the Suns, if you look back at their roster in 2005, Amari Stoudemire was their center. And he was all of 6'9", 6'10". And so maybe it's not uh, as much of like it is today, but I think it was really – they paved the way for how the game is played today. And I think if you look at the Rockets, they try to shoot as many threes as possible. Um, and so truly Mike D'Antoni's philosophy of, of being a coach in the NBA um, has not changed much since he was the coach of the Suns in the 5 6 season. So certainly an interesting time for the Phoenix Suns back in 2005. Sean, great work on this story and providing all the context for us. Thanks for, thanks, for, thanks for the time. Absolutely. Thanks, Rob. That wraps up today's remote edition of Cronkite Sports Now. And for more Arizona sports stories from around the valley, head over to the Cronkite Sports tab on ArizonaSports.com. And for top news stories, make sure you check out our website at CronkiteNews.azpbs.org. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you have a safe and happy week.